You ready? All right. Welcome back. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This is like the largest class I've had for a while. I think I should hand back exams every day. Um, so I hope you guys had a great break. Uh, as you can tell, today we're kind of off to like a slow, relaxed, sort of back falling into uh, non-spring break, right? So I hope you guys had a, a good time, some good time off, um, and I didn't ruin it by handing back an exam today. Um, but today the goal is to go over the exam. I'm going to put up the stats, uh, give you some idea of how you did relative to the rest of the class. The average on the exam was pretty low. It was about 25. So maybe that makes you feel better about your score, or really good about your score, depending on how well you did. Um, so, and, and then I want to go through the exam sort of question by question, just to give you a little bit of an insight into why these questions were on the exam, what they were designed uh, to elucidate about your understanding. So the, the point is that I, you know, I, this is the first time I'd ever written and given an exam, and I don't like it. Uh, and you guys are probably thinking, well, if you don't like it, then stop, you know? Um, but, but, you know, the, the, the point of doing this is not to create a hierarchy within the class. The point of doing this is so that you guys understand the progress that you're making towards learning the material that we'd like you to know, right? The nice thing is that on some level, the rest of the material that we're going to cover for this semester, it kind of starts to feel like variations on the same theme. Okay? We're going to see a lot of the same design principles that you were asked to write about in one of the long questions occur over and over again. And on some level, when we talk about storage and virtualization, we're going to see some of the same ideas emerge. So, uh, you know, I want you guys to feel, if you didn't, you know, do as well as you wanted to on the exam, that we're going to continue to reinforce some of these concepts, right? I would rather teach, I would rather have you guys remember one or two things from this class Right? If I have to have you guys repeat them every day and I have to find eight different ways to kind of get at them and get you guys to think about them, then cover all sorts of material and have you guys not remember anything except that the class was hard and the instructor wrote these really terrible exams that were really difficult and things like that. Right? So, so we're going to continue to kind of drum in some of the, the basics here. Right? But let's, let, me, uh, let me talk a little about the exam. We'll also talk a little bit about how grading in this class works because I think it's kind of an appropriate moment to discuss that. Um, all right, so the midterm, and this is not working because it's not on. That's a good reason for it not to work. Okay. All right, so just a couple of announcements before we get going. We're going to have uh, feedback on your design documents out by tomorrow. Um, the TAs don't know this, but they're going to be working hard on this for the next 24 hours. We'll also today, I think, post some idea of, of the rubric for our grading of the design documents, meaning here are the things that we wanted you guys to cover, right? Here are the things that we hoped you unearthed. Here are the things that we think are hard about the assignment. You guys may find that there are different things, but hopefully by this point you're also well into the process of making some significant uh, progress on assignment two, right? Which is due a week from today. Um, and then again, so for the rest of the semester, we're essentially at the halfway point. Uh, and we have about six weeks to go. And we're going to spend those six weeks uh, discussing largely storage and virtualization, right? I'm, I'm, still, I'm still unsure about how I'm going to do storage, partly because uh, I, I feel a little bit weird talking about spinning disks because uh, I think. I think by the time you guys are, are mature sort of Jedi masters, uh, spinning disks won't matter anymore, right? Or, or it will be very rare for you guys to actually encounter one. So we'll figure out how to do that. And then we're going to talk about virtualization. And we'll also sneak in a, a couple of lectures about operating system structure, which is usually covered earlier, but I decided to kind of wait because I think it makes more sense to talk operating system structure once you've seen the structure of an operating system, right? So, once you know what the components are, we can talk a little bit more about the design and talk about microkernels and macrokernels and monolithic kernels and exokernels and multi-kernels, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So this, this, this gets to be a little bit alphabet soupish, but it's kind of fun. All right, so again, this is my goal today. If you have questions about your specific grade on one of the questions, please approach the course staff during office hours. Uh, the grading for the exam was done over break while you guys were out you know, partying and then soaking up some sun, uh, and it was done by Fung, who graded the short answer questions, right? And Anudipa, who is proctoring an alternate 
uh, midterm makeup exam today, but she graded the multiple choice and the long answer question. So just so you know who to blame. Um, but if you have specific questions about the exam, please talk to them or talk to me if there are issues. Fi finally, I just thought, I just want to point this out just to head off any problems, which is that um, we scanned all the exams. So if, if you think that you could add a little bit to your answers and then turn them in for regrading, uh, don't, don't try it, because we know we, we, they're all scanned in. And why not? I mean, we just did it, because it's easy, right? You could just scan things. Um, OK, so OK, so remember, going back to our grading overview, this exam was worth 12% of the points in this class, right? 4% you got for free by just taking the, um, the preterm exam. And then 12 per percentage points for this. The final exam is going to be worth 24 points. The final exam is probably going to look a lot like this, actually. I kind of, I decided when I wrote this exam, I kind of like writing exams like this. Maybe you guys don't, but uh, I, think, I think I'd rather write an exam like this than a long uh, multiple choice exam. There's a possibility that the final will be a take home exam as well. I'm still sort of thinking about it. How many people would, would enjoy doing a 24 hour take home final exam rather than coming to class? for a three, whatever it is, like an hour, three hour winner take all. Who would prefer to do a 24 hour take home exam? The 24 hour take home exam would be written and designed to take like three or four hours, right? It would not be designed to take 24 hours. It's not a 24 hour long exam. It's an exam that you can take within a 24 hour window of time. All right, let me see that, those hands again. People who prefer a 24 hour take home exam. People who would prefer to sit for a whatever it is in two hour exam. OK, so that's about 50-50. OK, I, get, I think I get to make up my mind about this, which is good, because that's what I was going to do anyway. Um, OK, but we'll, we'll think about how to do that. All right, so this is just a reminder about how this works uh, in case, you know, again, you're disappointed by the midterm or, or elated by the midterm. It's, it's a small percentage of your grade, all right? All right, so here's, here were the statistics for the midterm. Again, the average was, was pretty low. The average was about 26. The median was also about a 26, right? Uh, we had 89 people who took the primary version of this exam. Most of you guys are here. If you took the alternate version, you know that. If you took the primary version, if you don't know what version you took, then you took the primary version. I wrote several versions of the exam because I gave one early, all right? Um, and, and again, I mean, I, I don't want to blow this out of proportion, but there were some people here who did very well in the exam. So it was actually kind of interesting that, that the, the max that most people got in the exam was about 40, 40 to 42. That was where the, the, the most of the high grades. However, there, there was one person who I think who, who maybe or not maybe here uh, who got a 48 out of. So is Robbie here? Nice job. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the, and the, the following. Top five grades, Keith, who I know is here, 43, nice work. John Gerber, 42, where's John? Yeah, yeah he's going to be embarrassed a little bit. Jimmy Wu, now, now everyone's going to come to you guys for questions, right? That's why I'm doing this. Um, is Jimmy here? I don't think Jimmy is here. Uh, and then there was a group down at 40, right? So Michael, Vikas, and uh, John Longenecker is here. Michael's here. Vikas is also here. And uh, Jason, I know, is out. All right, so let's give these guys a little hand. They did well on the exam. And again, I mean, the only reason to do this is so that you guys can bother these guys when you have questions about the material, right? There's one of me, there's six of them, seven of them, eight of them. I should have given more high grades. Uh, eight of them, right? So if you're struggling, these are good people to talk to. They understand the conceptual material, right? How they do on the programming assignments is a totally separate story, right? But these guys, these guys are getting the concepts, so they're good people to talk to. All right. So let's go question by question. So a multiple choice were designed to be easy. How many people felt the multiple choice were pretty easy? I hope they were. I mean, the multiple choice were exactly taken from the slides. Like literally, like I said, I looked at the slides and I said, here's a multiple choice question. You know, like here's a slide that has three things that are policy and three things that are mechanism. I can turn that into a multiple choice question, right? Actually, I turned that into two multiple choice questions. There was a parallel question on the alternate exam. So, the point is that these were not designed to be hard, and by and large, people did well, right? The median out of 10 was an 8, the average was a 7.8, right? I'm, I, I, we didn't break this down question by question. I'm curious how many people got the, the coming to class on time question, but I don't, I don't really care. So maybe, maybe we'll try to figure that out. All right. All right, so the short answer, so, so let me explain this. So with the short answer, what I did is we, we computed, let me, let me go back a second. So there are 89 total, right? Um, and we computed how many people decided to answer this question, 
right? Which means that they filled out something in the blank. And then we also tabulated how many people, for how many people was that question one of the top four short answer questions? So some people answered more short answer questions than they needed to. And for those people, you know, one of the answers wasn't counted, right? So you can see that there were, you know, it was clear to me in retrospect that some of these questions were easier than others. Uh, so for example, question four was a very popular question uh, and for good reason. That was the question on hardware, that was the question on interrupts? Yeah, okay, apparently that was easy. Because um, almost everybody decided to answer that question and the average was 3.8 out of five, which is by far the, the, the highest, right? On the other hand, question six, so you guys were pretty good at identifying the questions that were difficult. Not perfect though, right? Because uh, 84 people decided to try to answer question seven, which apparently was harder than you thought it was, right? So this, this, this is, these are just summary statistics. I'll post this stuff on the website, but this gives some idea of the overall breakdown, right? As with any exam, you know, I mean, my goal was to write six questions of equivalent difficulty, and I failed, right? Some of these were easier than others, or maybe I just did a better job at r teaching some of this material. So the point is that, that there was some spread in the averages here. All right, so for the, the long answer, the overall average, so as far as I could tell, the long answer question is, is really where people struggled, right? The average on this question was below 10 out of 20. So I think most people, the, this dragged down a lot of people. People lost a lot of points here, right? And you know, I understand that because this is not something that we've done a lot of in this class, right? This question asked you guys not just to repeat or to remember material that we covered, but actually to try to synthesize some new thought based on existing concepts, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, again, for this particular question, the two alternatives showed a fairly large grade spread, right? So question, the alternative one, we'll go over each one of these uh, answer by answer. Alternative one was uh, the user versus kernel multi-threading question. Uh, people, about half the people took the exam tried that question, and about, you know, the average was quite a bit lower. Alternative two was the design principles question, right? So, and the average on that one was a little bit higher. Again, if you have questions about your specific grade, please come talk to us, right? Uh, okay, any questions about the breakdown here? Questions, doubts. This is kind of supposed to be a little bit of a struggle session for me. So if you guys are mad about the midterm, it's a good time to to say something. Uh, you know, to be like, man, this is ridiculous. You know, I answered alternative one and I got totally screwed because it was hard, right? No one feels that way. I'm sure people feel that way. Everyone who answered question one feels that way. Deep. So I, I, think, I think alternate two is an easier question. Uh, and you know, what, what, what can I say? I mean, I, I feel like that, that's just, alternate one was designed to be a little bit more technical in nature, right? I, I, think it, I think it was a fair question in that if you understood uh, the material that we presented in class about threads, then that should have been an easy question to answer. But, but to, let, me, let me be honest, alternate two so alternate one was kind of a question that was aimed at the people in this class who might really think that they would go out and do sort of serious system programming, right, someday. Alternate two was aimed at the other 90% of you, right, who are taking this class because it's a requirement and don't intend to ever hack on a kernel again once you get through this miserable OS 161 stuff. But you guys are gonna write software, okay? And as we talked about at the beginning of this course, one of the things about this class is learning design principles that you can take with you when you work on other software projects. So that was what assign, that's what, what Alternative 2 was really trying to get at, right? Was design principles that are broader and bigger than just computer systems, right? They're not about just operating systems, they're not about just computer systems. They're, they're bigger and they're good, they're good ideas that you can take with you no matter what you're working on, right? And, and really, in some ways, the question was also trying to push you guys to take some of these good system design principles and find kind of cute uh, applications for them outside of computer science. I don't know how many people, how many people answered one of those, at least one of those examples was something that wasn't drawn from computer systems. Did anyone come up with good? Okay, John. Did anyone come up with good examples that, that weren't computer systems? How many people came up with good examples that weren't from operating systems? 
like from networks or other sort of types of programming. Okay, so that, that was kind of the point, right? Any other questions? We're looking at the score by score breakdown. All right, so, so but let me step back and, and in case you guys are nervous, right? Because this, this exam, and I told my wife and she was like, oh man, like that's terrible, you know? People got a 50% on your exam, you're a terrible professor. Like, uh, yeah, I know that. Yeah. No, nothing, nothing different than what she tells me on a regular basis. Um, but so the, the point is, you know, how, putting these grades in context, right? So this is, this is how we are going to grade this class. This is, this is actually how it's going to happen, right? So at the end of the day, you guys are essentially accumulating points. Uh, this is the, these are the first points that you've, that you've accumulated that we've actually measured. We're almost done with grading assignment zero. We know we're behind on the assignment grading, so we need to catch up on that. But we're going to add up all your points, and then we're going to put you guys up on some sort of big board, and we're going to go through and we're going to start to look for logical clumps of students, right? Students that we think their performance overall, when we've calculated all the different components, is indistinguishable, right? And normally what happens when you do this is that you see that there are cohorts, right? That there's a group of students that are all, you know, at the top with a, within, within a certain range of scores, and then there's kind of a natural place for a division, right? So this is a very much a manual process, and the point is to try to, to map these points that we're giving you to letter grades. But that's not actually going to happen until the very, very, very end of class, right? So, you know, a 25 out of 50 on this midterm is meaningful only in the sense that, you know, there's 25 points that might put somebody else, although there was almost no one who, I mean, nobody got a perfect score, and there were few, very few people who got over a 40, right? But that might put them into another cohort at the end of the day. But it probably, it probably won't, right? Because a lot of the points are still on the board, right? So most of the points are, are for things like the programming assignments. The other thing I want to point out about the midterm, in case it's not immediately obvious, is that the midterm tests your ability to come in here and sit down for 50 minutes and sort of, uh, you know, really sort of nail an exam based on the material you have in your head, right? And for people like me, you know, I'm, I'm not super fond of that skill. That skill has uses, right? But the number of times that you guys are actually going to sit down and have to, you know, like there's 50 minutes and there's a bomb about to go off. And if you don't answer the question correctly about user versus kernel multi-threads, the world is going to perish, right? Like, this is not a feasible scenario, right? It is possible that, you know, you'll have a month-long deadline and you'll be trying to push a new piece of software and you'll really, you know, you'll be really required to, to, to pound out some pretty good code, but that's really more about determination. So I, I see this part of the class, this component of your grade, the midterm and the final, really. So that's about 40% are the this is the brightness component, right? This is the smartness component. It has to some degree to do with just your innate intelligence and then how much time you've spent going over the lecture materials, how many questions you come ask me during office hours, how many times you rewatch the really exciting lecture videos online, et cetera, right? The other 60%, which is thankfully bigger, is, are the determination points, right? So you guys don't have to stop working on these assignments till you're done. Right? Or until you run out of time. And when you guys turn in assignment two, there might be one group that spends five hours on it. How many people have already spent over five hours on it? Okay, so there probably won't be a group that says five hours on it, but maybe it'll be the group that spends like 15 hours on it, right? And there's gonna be another group that spends 150 hours on it. And we can't tell it apart, right? All we're gonna do is test it and see if it works, right? So that, that part of the grade is really much, much more in your control. I know you guys have other things to do, but you know, that part of the grade is kind of like being able to take the midterm and spend twice as long or three times as long as somebody else on it, right? You know, it's not over until you give up, okay? Any questions about the grading for <coughs> overall class? Okay, and I think I'm on a slide, so okay, so let me pull up the uh, solution set for the midterm, which I will make available via email today. Okay. Uh, come on. And Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to dwell on the multiple choice. These, these, does anyone have any questions on the multiple choice questions? Questions that they think are answers they think were just blatantly wrong? All right, going once, going twice, 
questions on the multiple choice? All right, good. All right, so let's talk. Let's let's talk. Uh, let me go back here and just review. Okay, so why don't we go through these questions in some sort of reasonable order? So the most difficult question based on the average, uh, as far as the short answer, was question number six. So let's look at that one. All right. All right. So this was a question about kernel privilege. All right. The reason this question is on the exam is because kernel privilege is the thing that makes kernel, the kernel different than just some normal application, right? The kernel is a piece of computer code, right? I think some of you guys are starting to, to get a feeling for this. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. As you, as you work on assignment two, right? But the kernel is, you know, a, a piece of computer code. And it's, in some ways, very similar to any other application you run on your system, right? The difference is, as we've talked over and over about, is that the kernel has special privileges, right? The kernel has special powers that other applications don't have, and it's required to do that to, in order to multiplex resources, right? So this question starts with the premise that these privileges are needed to multiplex virtual memory, and then asks you guys to describe what special privileges are required, how they're used, and what would happen if the kernel didn't have them, right? So you know, I didn't get a chance to see the individual answers. Uh, does anyone who answered this question want to talk a little or make a comment about their answer or where they got hung up or why this question felt difficult? One of the things I worried about with this question was just that it was a little too, maybe it was even a little too obvious, right? Like the last part, what would happen if the kernel didn't have these special privileges? Well, applications could just sort of barf all over each other's memory, right? But maybe we've got you guys to the point where you don't even see that as a, as a possibility. That's just, the world can't be there, right? Any questions about this question on the exam? Who, who answered this question? Raise your hand. All right. You guys don't have any questions about this question. All right, let's go on. Okay, question, the next most difficult question was Question seven. Describe the trade-off surrounding memory page size. What happens when become pages become very small? What happens when pages become very large? So I, I'll, I'll be honest. I, don't, I didn't anticipate this question was going to be hard. How many people answered this question? Raise your hand if you answered this question. Okay, this was a popular question to answer. Um, does anyone want to make a comment about their answer and how they lost points? Or whether they lost points? Isaac? Nobody said, nobody said that you had to mention good and bad trade offs. Um, a lot of people answer exactly what you're saying in terms of education. They got bitter and stuff, but there's two points. Right? Two points, pretty much. It's okay. Not even, it's not even exactly, but you know, there's more to answer than that. So. Yeah, there's, well, I mean, again, this, 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 I felt like this question had a pretty straightforward and short answer. So, you know, maybe the grading on this question was a little bit aggressive. It's possible. So, so, the most important, I mean, uh, so you, got, you got what? I got three out of five. I'm okay. Sure. And, and what, what do you, can you identify things that were missing from your answer? Uh, I didn't do good stuff. Uh, that's probably what I'm asking. Ah, okay. Bad, bad, bad things. Gotcha. Okay. And there, and there is a fair amount of symmetry to these things, right? Like the good and bad things are paired, right? So maybe, maybe we will revisit the grading of this question in terms of, on the other hand, of course, you have to remember, the, the, as long as the grading is consistent, right? Although, you're right. I mean, we should make sure that we rectify this with respect to the other questions. John. Uh-huh. Okay. Keith? I pretty much word for word for the bad part. I only got two out of five for it. Okay. Okay. So, so maybe for this question, we need to um, go back and take out some of the symmetry. Can we do that, Fung? Okay. So if, if you answered this question, right, this is why we're doing this. If you answered this question and you lost points, and again, I, I think, 
I, I was, this is the question that I was most confused about because a lot of people chose to answer the question, which means I think that people sensed that this question was an easy mark, right? And yet the grading was a little bit low. So it sounds like maybe people are missing one or two points on this question. If, uh, I guess there's, let's see, I guess there's two things we can do here, right? And, and I'll, I'll consider both. The first one is easier. The first one is just we apply some sort of across the board correction to this question only, right? Maybe we add a point, right, or two points to everybody's answer. The other, uh, the other approach is you guys come in individually and meet with the core staff and we try to figure out how your answer makes sense, all right? So we, we will think about this. I don't want to open up massive cans of worms here because if I start doing this, then the, the people who answered question six are going to want to go back and start complaining about question six, right? But I think that's a fair point. I think that there is a lot of symmetry to this answer, so maybe what we can do is make sure that if people got the bad points on both sides or the good points on both sides, that those reflect across, all right? All right, okay. So let me, uh, somebody other than me is listening, so uh, we can make notes of this. Okay, so let's go on. That's a good point. So the next most difficult question was question two. That is, ah, no, that's this one. That was easy. Question two. Okay, so this is this I was also a little bit surprised by because I thought this question was was mechanical and probably uh, not that difficult to go through. It, this this was not a terribly. This was the least popular question to answer. Okay. Is anybody who did this question and is feeling unsatisfied uh, by their grade? Their, received want to make a comment about the question? I mean, unless there's something wrong with this question, I think this is going to be a difficult one to quibble with, right? Because this is, again, designed to be fairly mechanical, right? And I even made it easier by using base, te base 10 arithmetic, which, which I don't know, feel, makes me feel a little dirty, but I think it's the right thing to do. Malik. Well, I mean, we, we want to see the whole address, right? We definitely wanted to see the, the eventual instruction that would have been executed. I thought you wanted us to see that which page and which offset would be necessary. I mean, if, if you think you have an answer that's functionally equivalent to this, yeah. then come talk to us and, and we'll look at it again. Anybody else comments on this question? Yeah? Yeah, I mean, um, for three and five, I identified was it a bit TLB point or a page point and or. I didn't really go beyond that. Okay. Okay. We, I mean, maybe we can. We might think about making that one. But yeah, I mean, we wanted, we, we wanted to know kind of what would happen, right? I think that was, I think that was specified, right? Um, describe what would happen if each of the following pseudo instruction works were executed, right? And, and we went over something like this in class, right, with the segmentation. So I, th I think I established some ground rules for this. Any other questions on this this question? All right, now the next two I hope will go a little faster because they were easier. So uh, questions three and five were both had pretty high averages. I think people did well on these questions. Question three, where's my, uh, question three was locating bugs. And of course there was, there was no, there, there was no surfeit of problems with this code. Most of them were pretty obvious. Uh, and then question five was, um, identifying between interactive and non-interactive threats. Any questions on these two, these two questions? Question three, question five from the short answer section. Any, any frustrations? I know you guys are just seeing the exam. We're just, we're just doing this right now because I want some feedback on the questions and I think we've already got some useful feedback. So this is kind of the process of debugging the midterm. If you guys have doubts later about your answers, please come talk to the core staff, right? I mean, you guys, I'm sure you'll sit down and look at the feedback that the TFs have provided. John? I think it may be useful for us on some of them where it asks us like two questions or three questions. If Yep. I just, you know, you get like a set point mark where you yep. don't know how you did on the individual ones. Yeah, yeah. So, so why don't, why don't, why don't we do this? I will have, um, I will have Fung and Anodipa try to come up with some, because I know they have rubrics that they used. 
So I'll have them sort of describe the rubrics, and we can put that either on the solution side or we'll send it out via email. That's a, that's a good point. In those cases, that's not, they're not always going to add up, right? Like there might be, if there's three parts and it's a five-point question, it might be two points per part up to five points, or two points off per part down to zero points, right? So. All right, any, any questions on three and five? And then the, the question that, that everybody seemed to really enjoy answering was this one. Uh, and I don't want to spend too much time on it because the median was a four. So most people seem to do well on this particular question. But any other questions? Any questions on four? All right, going once, going twice. Questions three, four, and five. This is the soft underbelly of the, of the short answer question section. All right. So let's look at the long answer uh, questions. Just, we don't have a huge amount of time, but we have a few minutes. All right, so I already touched a little bit on, on both of these questions, but let me give you an idea of rationale here. I'm happy to do rationale for the other questions. I know I kind of stopped doing that, but I hope the rationale, at least in certain places, is clear, right? Um, so again, the system design principles is on here because these are the things I actually care about you guys learning or at least remembering, right? Having some idea of, of of the existence of and the application of, because I think that this, these are things that will make you guys stronger programmers and stronger uh, technologists, right? These, I mean, th th these are some of the, the hard-earned lessons that the computer science systems community has spent 50 years, 60 years fighting their way to understand, right? And, and the reason these are, the reason we try to teach people these is because, not because they're not obvious, Right? Because some of them are kind of obvious, and that's fine. The reason that we teach them is because people, including me, smart people constantly ignore them. Right? That's the weird thing. I mean, some, sometimes you have this, you know, when you're having conversations with systems people, it's like, oh, yeah, well, everybody knows that. It's like, well, why don't they do it? Right? If everybody knows it. I mean, keep it simple, stupid, right? I mean, this is a very, this is actually kind of a deep idea, right? For, for a lot of people, and yet the number of, systems that seem to, to, um, to struggle with this is, is pretty incredible, right? So, so my favorite example of keep it si simple, stupid, do you guys remember Friendster? How many people ever used Friendster? Friendster, really nobody? I'm old, okay. Uh, Friendster was a, an early social networking site. You know, how many people think that Facebook was the first social networking site ever created? That's good, because it wasn't clearly. There were predecessors, and Friendster was one of them, right? And, and it's an interesting, I mean, it's a long, you can have a long conversation about why Facebook rose to, to, to the position of relative dominance in this area. But one of the, th one of the things that Friendster tried to do was, was fr Friendster was entirely, Friendster didn't have any notion of school or any notion of company. It was entirely trying to connect people based on their social networking graphs. Right? So the idea was, you know, if I'm within four degrees of separation from Isaac through our mutual friends, then I should be able to access information about him. Right? So how often do you think that friend graph changes? It's like constantly. Right? So, I mean, Fr Friendster had a lot of issues. Right? It was a really slow site. But I remember reading somewhere that one of their, one of their design issues was simply that they were trying to do all this based on these graph traversals, and yet this graph was constantly changing, right, as people were adding and removing friends. And so the system got so slow, right? And rather than think about a simpler way to address their problem that, that might not have had that feature, I mean, when Facebook came out, you could only, Facebook had these very, very nice uh, vertically oriented you know, uh, s spheres of, of social contact. If you went to school with somebody, you could see their profile. That's how it was in the early days before they added 10 gazillion privacy features, right? But it used to be, you know, like if you went to Harvard and this other guy went to Harvard, you could see his profile. And that was really easy, right? You can imagine that makes determining whether or not you can see a person's information very, very fast. Whereas for Friendster, it was incredibly slow, right? And now that Facebook has matured, it has some of those Friendster-like features, right? But on some level, Facebook took a simpler, easier approach first, and they got it to work. They also had a site that looked better, right? But you didn't go to Facebook and sit there for 10 seconds waiting for the page to load, right? So it had some nice problems. Anyway, sorry about the digression, but the, the, the point of this question was to try to get you guys to, to talk about some of these design principles, right? Any questions about 
the second alternative system design principles question. And then why don't I quickly just, I mean, again, we're going to send out these answers via email. But so examples of system design principles, separation of policy from mechanism. I think we've talked about that one multiple times. Keep it simple, stupid was not one that came up a lot, but it did come up several times. Use the past to predict the future. I think that hopefully that one's been drummed pretty well into your heads by now. Uh, using caches to make a big thing seem uh, faster or putting a fast thing or using a big slow thing to make a small fast thing seem bigger. It's kind of the, these are kind of duels of each other, right? Adding a level of indirection to allow the system to have more control over translation and, and to play some games about where things are. And then avoiding doing things immediately that you might never have to do, right? So we talked about that with demand paging. So any questions about these principles? And then the other, again, I mean, the other question here was the one about user and kernel threads. And the idea behind this question was to try to see if people had a really detailed knowledge of what it means to do threading. And I think this is a fair question because we talked about it in class. And also, you guys are doing this for assignment two, right? So for assignment two, if you're off to the right start, you've seen a lot of the, the functions in OS 161 that create and manipulate threads, right? And there's no magic here. Right? I mean, thread state is stored in memory somewhere. Right? Thread context is stored in memory. And switching threads means unloading and reloading registers. And there's no reason that a lot of this stuff can't be done in user space. And in fact, it frequently is. Right? As far as the trade-offs, right? I mean, that's, that I, probably is a part of the question that people struggled a little bit more with. Right? And the fundamental thing you had to notice there was that creating threads and manipulating threads in the kernel requires context switching into the kernel. And we've talked several times about context switch overhead, right? And so that means that things like thread creation and thread destruction are very slow, right? So the, the general, and I'll, I'll let you guys again see the solution at some point. These are more difficult to view here because they span multiple pages. But the idea with this problem was that we wanted you to identify the fact that context switching is slow. That means certain types of thread operations are much more expensive to do inside the kernel. And that means that applications that use threads for sort of small tasks, like I fork off a thread to handle the fact that the user clicked a button and then that thread dies or exits, those applications do much better with user thread libraries, right? Applications that use kernel threads like web servers frequently fork off a whole pool of threads that essentially sit there processing tasks from a queue and live until the entire application shuts down. Right? And that's how they avoid the overhead of creating and destroying threads. They keep a set of threads around that is designed to be large enough for a large task that they might have to perform. But when the system is idle, those threads still sit there. Right? And they're just sleeping, not doing much. Right? OK, any questions about the long answer questions? All right, so Wednesday, we're going to go on. There might be a little sort of memory stuff that we need to clean up, but probably not. We're probably going to do storage. So this is the third big unit in the class. We're going to talk about disks, file systems. There's a lot of similarities here between virtual memory management. So we'll have a chance to reinforce some of that. And that'll be awesome. So I will see you then.